Sitar Wenislan. Madam President, members of the Security Council, as we approach 140 days of devastating war, there is still no end in sight. No end to the trauma of those impacted by the horrors unleashed on 7 October. No end to the suffering and desperation of the people in Gaza. No end to the regional turmoil. I was in Gaza this week to see firsthand the unfolding tragedy and to meet with our tireless and brave teams on the ground who face impossible challenges to deliver life-saving assistance to Palestinian civilians in the Strip. What I saw was shocking and unsustainable. I'm deeply concerned about a possible full-scale Israeli military operation in the densely populated Rafah area, where some 1.4 million Palestinians are sheltering and where we have the only points of entry of humanitarian goods. I cannot stress enough how urgently we need a deal that will bring about humanitarian ceasefire and the release of hostages. I reiterate my call for the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages and for a humanitarian ceasefire. In the meantime, I will continue to urge all concerns, including Israeli authorities, to address the key impediments to our humanitarian response on the ground. We need more safety measures, greater security, and the tools and access points to scale up aid, particularly in the north of the Strip. I'm also continuing my extensive engagement in the region and internationally to both support all efforts towards a ceasefire and bring about a more common understanding and coordinated approach to address the complex humanitarian security and political crisis affecting us not only Gaza, but the whole of the occupied Palestinian territory, Israel and the region. <clears throat> I am convinced that there is no time to lose in laying a framework for Gaza's recovery and for long-term political solutions on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, including by advancing meaningful, irreversible steps towards a two-state solution. Madam President, according to the Ministry of Health in Gaza, from 18 January to 16 February, 4,327 Palestinians were killed and over 7,000 injured in fighting and Israeli operations in the Strip, bringing the total Palestinian fatalities in the war to more than 28,000, many women and children. The IDF has said that over 10,000 Palestinian fatalities are militants. In addition to the approximately 1,200 fatalities 7 October in Israel, Israeli Defense Forces reported 235 Security Forces personnel killed in Gaza since ground operation began. <coughs> Sorry. Of the 253 hostages kidnapped on 7 October, some 134 are believed to be still held hostage by Hamas. 112 have been freed and 11 bodies recovered. <coughs> 160 UN staff have been killed in Gaza, the largest single loss of life in the history of the organization. President, battles have continued across Gaza, including a campaign in Khan Yunis that began in late January and more recently intensified their strikes in the densely populated Rafah area. Hospitals, schools and other protected sites continue to be severely impacted by military operations. The IDF has said that its forces are targeting Hamas fighters and equipment, as well as large-scale tunnel networks under these and other civilian infrastructure using, used for mili military purposes. On 15 February, the IDF entered Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunis following days of shelling and sniper fire that killed 13 Palestinians. During a multi-day operation, IDF arrested over 100 Palestinians, including health workers, who they said were involved in militant activities, including the 7 October Hamas attack in Israel. While the World Health Organization evacuated some 50 critical patients, including children, more than 100 patients remained behind and seven were reportedly died after generators were shut down. 
Israeli forces said they were acting on information that Hamas had hostages in the facilities and were actively using the facility for military purposes. Palestinian armed groups continued to fire indiscriminate rockets from Gaza towards Israel or bite at reduced frequency and range. Madam President, let me return in more details to where I started this briefing, the desperate humanitarian situation in Gaza. IDPs face acute shortages of food, water, shelter, and medicine. Communicable diseases are rising amid unsanitary conditions, and over 2 million people face extreme food insecurity with women and children at greatest risk. This desperation and scarcity has led to a near total breakdown in law and order. Essential services have been heavily impacted by the fighting. 84% of health and education facilities are either damaged or destroyed. Over 62% of all roads and electricity feeder lines are unusable. My deputy and humanitarian coordinator has a plan to deliver the essentials, the food, the shelters, the medicine and water and sanitation, but our capacity to deliver depends on coordinated humanitarian movements, effective deconflictions with the parties and Israeli approvals for essential communication equipment and armed vehicles, all of which provide the minimum condition for staff to work safely. This must be improved. UN convoys and compounds must not be hit, and our equipment needs clearance fast. Keeping Gaza on a drip feed not only deprives a desperate population of life saving support, it drives even greater chaos on the ground and further impedes humanitarian delivery. On 20 February, World Food Programme announced that it was forced to pause deliveries to northern Gaza following multiple security incidents. Convoy movements had just resumed two days earlier, following a three-week suspension in the wake of a strike on the UN truck. For this reason, I renew our appeal to open additional access points to the northern part of Gaza to increase the flow of aid reduce congestions in the south and relieve some of the pressures on the population and the staff seeking to deliver. Madam President, Israel has provided information that 12 UNVA staff were involved in the brutal attacks against the Israelis on 7 October. These allegations are appalling and such acts must be condemned. The Secretary General and UNWA took swift actions, including terminating employment of the 10 active staff members and launching internal and independent investigations. Nevertheless, key donors have suspended aid, amounting to over half of the agency forecasted income for 2024. While we address the very serious allegations at hand, we must recognize that UNRWA remains the backbone of humanitarian response on the ground. I reiterate the ESD's appeal to donors to guarantee the continuity of UNRWA's operation, not only for Gaza, but for the stability of the region. Madam President, turning to the occupied West Bank, 27 Palestinians, including eight children, were killed by Israeli security forces the majority in the context of Israeli operations in Area A, often including armed exchanges with Palestinians. On 30 January, an un undercover IDF unit killed three Palestinians inside a hospital in Jenin, one of whom was a patient. The IDF said that the three who were claimed by members of armed groups were planning an attack against the Israelis. During the reporting period, Three Israelis, including one woman, was killed in Palestinian shooting attacks in the occupied West Bank and in Israel, including two at a bus stop on 16 February by Palestinians, who was also killed on the scene. In today's early morning hours, a deadly terror attack by three Palestinians against Israeli commuters near Mal Adumim settlement outside Jerusalem is yet another reminder of the boiling tension 
on the ground. Separate attacks against Palestinians and their property also continued. <clears throat> on 1st of February, US President Biden issued an executive order imposing sanctions on persons undermining peace, security, and stability in the West Bank. Four Israeli settlers have been sanctioned under the order, while the UK and France have also announced sanctions against settlers. Settlement activities also continued as Israeli authorities published tenders for approximately 420 housing units in Area C settlements. <clears throat> On 14 February, after an extended legal battle, Israeli authorities demolished the home of a prominent community leader in al Bustan in occupied East Jerusalem, citing the lack of Israeli-issued building permits, which are almost impossible for Palestinians to obtain. I am concerned that if the violence in Gaza does not end, the tensions and restrictions remain high in the West Bank, including at the holy sites in East Jerusalem. The holy month of Ramadan risks becoming another volatile marker rather than a time for contemplation and healing. I also remain deeply concerned about the economy of the West Bank and the PA's fiscal crisis. <clears throat> In this context, I welcome Norway's announcement on 18 February that an arrangement was reached with the parties to facilitate a partial transfer of the money clearance revenue, not included the amount Israeli say PA transfers to Gaza. <clears throat> I'm also encouraged that the Palestinian Prime Minister announced several judicial, security, administrative and financial reforms last month but more remains to be done. Madam President, in the international arena on 26 February, the International Court of Justice issued provisional measures in the case of South Africa versus Israel on the application of the Convention of the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide in, Gaza, in the Gaza Strip. I welcome the recent visit of the Special Representative of the Secretary General on sexual violence in conflict to gather information on reports of sexual violence in the context of the 7 October attacks. Madam President, I remain gravely concerned over the serious risk for a further regional escalation. Across the Blue Line, exchanges of fire between Israel and Hezbollah continue to intensify with several civilian casualties reported in recent days. Approximately 100,000 Israelis and over 87,000 Lebanese are displaced from the communities. Firing from Syria towards the Israeli-occupied Golan and strikes by Israel against targets in Syria also continued, including Syrian claims of Israeli strikes on locations in Damascus and Homs. On 28 January, three U.S. soldiers were killed and over 40 injured in a drone attack on a U.S. military outpost in the northern part of Jordan. U.S. forces responded with strikes on targets in Syria and Iraq. Houthi forces continued to launch attack against vessels in the Red Sea, with strikes reported against Houthi targets in Yemen. Attacks against international shipping routes must cease immediately. I urge all relevant actors to take steps to immediately de-escalate. Madam President, in the scale of the emergency we are facing is staggering and could quickly spiral out of control in the region. I appeal for the collective coordinated and comprehensive response to not only address the immediate crisis before us in Gaza, but to help restore a political horizon for Palestinians and Israelis alike, while promoting greater stability and peace in the region. To do this, we urgently need a deal to achieve humanitarian ceasefire and the release of hostages. We need to create a space for moving forward through dialogue rather than violence. Ultimately, the long-term solution for Gaza is political. While taking into account Israel's legitimate security concerns, there must be a clear path towards restoring a single, effective Palestinian 
governance across the OPT, including in Gaza. International support to strengthening and reforming the Palestinian Authority to improve domestic and international legitimacy will be crucial. To create the condition for this work, there must be a time-bound steps within a political framework to end the occupation and to establish a two-state solution in line with relevant UN resolutions, international law and bilateral agreements. These efforts must coalesce and accelerate if we are to emerge from the nightmare into the trajectory that can provide Palestinians and Israelis with a chance of lasting peace. Thank you. I thank Mr. Wenesland for his briefing. I now give the floor to Mr. Christopher Lockyer.